Hi guys and welcome to this tutorial in which we will cover the basics of the reviewing process for peer-reviewed conferences. My name is Evgen Leitko, I'm an associate professor in computer science and machine learning from saint Etienne, France, and I'd like to share my experience of writing scientific reviews with you, hoping that you might find it helpful. First thing first, let's agree on what this tutorial is and what it isn't, so that you will know what to expect from it. You've probably seen many guidelines on conference websites showing you the examples of good and bad reviews and various explanations on how your review should be structured. They all seem great and helpful, so the question that you may ask yourself is, why would I want to watch this video? The answer is, because following the guidelines to assess whether your review is good or not requires writing the review first. Baba, right? If you've never done it before, then the starting point is not whether your review is good or not, but rather how do I write the review itself? Where do I start? This is exactly the question that I'll try to answer in this short tutorial. Before doing that, let's agree on one thing from the very beginning. Reviewing takes time. There is no magic involved and there are really no buts to it, it's just as simple as that. Whether you're a junior reviewer or a senior one, you'll need time to read the paper thoroughly to be able to write a good review and eventually get back to it a couple of times to finalize it. How much time exactly? The survey conducted by the organizers of this tutorial among the senior area chairs and the area chairs of the ACL conference suggests that it takes around 3 to 4 hours to write a review for a regular paper and 1 to 2 hours for a short paper. Yeah, it takes half a day per paper to write a good review. Also, apart from setting aside enough time to do it, you should be in the right mindset. Really, writing a review of somebody else's work on a bad day would hardly be objective, and we all have bad days. So the takeaway of this part, writing reviews requires you to set aside half a day, make sure that your dog didn't die on that same day, and you should be good to go. Now about writing the actual review and where to start. You may be surprised to learn that the best entry point for this is actually to read the introduction and the abstract of the paper that you're about to review. Shocking, right? Many people think that those are just empty words that can be skipped altogether and move directly to the theorems, optimization problems and tables with bold numbers that give more factual details of the paper's contributions. This is a common mistake in my opinion. Understanding the high-level idea of the paper should really come first and the introduction and the abstract are the most accessible ways to get it. Otherwise, what you get is all those raging authors on Twitter and Reddit saying that reading the reviews for their work felt like they were written for some other paper. The main takeaway message of this part, never skip the abstract and the introduction of the paper. Use them to write down a list of concrete, high-level contributions of the paper and read its remaining sections in order to find arguments that confirm, if they do, those claims. This gives you a good basis to start with. At first, approximate high-level summary of the paper and a potential list of pros and cons with supported and flawed claims of the paper. As an example, let us consider this abstract coming from the NICLR submission accepted in 2018. While reading it, I can get some valuable pointers to what I expect from this paper in the following sections. First, I immediately spot the main area of this submission, which is a study of the attention mechanism in deep convolutional networks with human supervision. At this point, I do not care how that will be implemented. What I want to know is the high-level intuition of the main contribution of this paper indicated in this abstract in a very highly accessible way. Let's move on. Next part of the paper is usually dedicated to the related works. Let's be honest, this part usually sucks. As a reviewer, you may be overwhelmed by the tons of pointers to the existing literature given by the authors, especially for papers in emerging areas with many concurrent works. So how to filter out important references from those that are only very distantly related? Are we supposed to read all of them? Or should you merely trust in what the authors highlight as the major differences and move on with that? Also, if there are indeed some missing references, then how do we find them? Unfortunately, it's impossible to give a complete answer to this question, but here are some useful hints. First, important references are usually given in a standalone manner and are repeated at least a couple of times in the following sections. Once you've identified those, it's really desirable to have a quick look at them. Let us come back to the example of the paper that I showed you in the abstract part to understand how you actually identify the important references in a given paper. For instance, here we can see that the Lindsley paper is cited at least three times in the same paragraph. This indicates that most likely the Lindsley L paper is an important reference that you will need to check before reading the remaining parts of this section. On the other hand, you can see also the reference to Jean Gheal, which points out to a dataset that is very close to the dataset proposed by the authors. 
When going further down in the paper, you can see that the Linsley Al reference appears multiple times, as well as the one uh, that refers to Jean Gael. These two references is the minimum requirement to review this particular paper in order to understand how the contributions proposed by the authors are different from what was proposed before in the literature. Second, about the missing references and how to find them, there is really no magic solution. Oh, wait, actually there is it. It's called Google Scholar Search. Just put the keywords from the paper and briefly read the abstracts to see if some of the return results that were not cited are relevant to the paper you are reviewing. <laughs> Let's now move on to the low-level details of the paper's contributions itself. This part is where you have a chance to make a brilliant and constructive remarks that show the low-level understanding of the paper. Get the list of the claims that you wrote from the abstract and the introduction and set on the quest of finding evidence supporting them. Here are some common tricks based on the type of the contribution that you review. First types of the contributions are the theoretical ones. Many papers now tend to include a theoretical justification for the proposed algorithm or the insight that they try to illustrate to make their paper more sound. Such results are usually given by theorems established in learning or generalization bounds of different kinds, with lengthy proofs postponed to the supplementary material that, let's be honest, most of the reviewers rarely read. Reviewing such contributions can be tricky, as maths used to prove them can be rather involved and requires the background that you may not have. However, don't be desperate when facing such a situation. Even in this case, there are some important things that you, as a reviewer, can do. The most important of them is to check that the stated level of generality holds for the obtained results, given the assumptions made, and whether the implications deduced by the authors really follow from those results. I usually do this by first verifying the conditions for the variables in the statement, sample size, for instance. Usually, they are assumed to be greater or smaller than the quantity defined with half of the Greek alphabet. Sometimes those can be negative or lower or upper bounded by values which do not make sense in the considered learning setup. Then I proceed by carefully reading the general assumptions in order to make sure that they do not violate the considered learning setup as well. If the paper fails on one of these checks, then you should provide evidence for it and ideally suggestions for improvement. I will give you as an example one of the papers that I authored recently with my colleagues. In this paper, we established the equivalence of local minima of deep neural networks to their global optimum under some conditions. In particular, we consider four different assumptions, with some of them being related to the weights of the neural network, some being related to the architecture of the neural network, and some others being related to the input data and the loss function used. The stated level of generality here refers exactly to this. We cannot claim that our results hold for any loss function used. For instance, the cross entropy will violate the assumption for and at the same time, we cannot claim that our results hold for any possible application of the deep neural network as we make a particular assumption of the positivity of the learning samples. As a reviewer, your duty is to check those assumptions and to make sure that the claims made by the authors do not violate them. If everything seems okay in this part, you can move on and look at the proof in the supplementary material. Another important part of many papers is the one dedicated to the empirical evaluations. Just as we agreed in the beginning that reviewing takes time, let us now agree on another important thing. Empirical results should not be expected to always beat the current state of the art. I know this goes against what you've seen in most of the papers at the conferences so far, and this is why it is important to underline it. Experimental results may serve very different, yet equally insightful purposes. Sometimes they are provided to confirm theoretical results or to show their potential usefulness and versatility in new real-world applications. And sometimes the performance of competing methods are on par for one metric, say accuracy, but provide an important improvement in terms of some other metric, for instance execution time. The recipe for reviewing this part is to clearly understand the purpose of the experiments. Most likely the authors already explained what was the main message of their paper in the introduction, that you've read very carefully, didn't you? And your duty is to make sure that the experiments are aligned with it. A good example to illustrate this point are the papers on the algorithmic fairness in machine learning. In such papers, authors usually seek to find a trade-off between maintaining the high accuracy of the classifier and improving its fairness. As a reviewer, you cannot require from the authors to improve both of these metrics, as in most of the cases it cannot be done. Second step is to make sure that the experiments are conducted in a reproducible way following a sound evaluation protocol. The elements that can attract your attention with this regard are some unexplained algorithmic choices. For instance, in this paper, the authors say that they use six mid to high level feature layers in ResNet architecture to introduce the attention model. 
and the precise numbers of these layers, but never explain how that can be generalized to other architectures or why this particular choice was made. The same holds for the data collection process, where some choices should be explained in order for the paper to be reproducible. For instance, in this case, the authors use the attention maps derived from the human supervision, even though those, some of those maps were not useful for the deep convolutional network to recognize the image correctly. The question that you may ask as a reviewer is why would you use those seemingly unuseful maps? I would also highly recommend using the part on reported experimental results from Joel Pino's reproducibility checklist for machine learning papers for this purpose. Finally, in many papers, the main contribution is given by a new algorithm derived from the optimization of some objective function. Two main things to check here. First one is the way used to arrive at this particular objective function and its fidelity to the intuition given by the authors about their method. The question to ask here is, does it really reflect what it should? Second is to check some basic properties of the objective function to be optimized. For instance, is it convex or not? If not, can we say anything about its convergence to the stationary points for the optimization method used by the authors? Can we confirm through empirical evaluation that the obtained solution tend to vary a little for different initializations? Note, however, that you should not see all these questions merely as a source of criticism, but rather as a source of constructive remarks that will help the authors to improve their manuscript for the camera diversion or the next ambition. At this point, everything seems to be ready to write the final review. You have a summary showing that you understand the paper really well. You have a list of declared contributions and in-depth remarks and suggestions for improvement. What's missing for all this to be over? Two things, actually. First, you need to assess the level of confidence for your review. My rule of thumb here is the following. Reviews for papers from the area to which I contributed recently with at least two papers of my own deserve one of the two highest levels of confidence. The latter choice will usually depend on whether there are some out-of-the-field methods involved or not. In case of the PhD students who may not have any accepted manuscripts, this applies to the narrow area of your PhD. Do not lower your confidence level only to appear humble. If everyone does it, area chair will have to call for additional reviewers that may not be available at later stages of the reviewing process or to rely only on his or her own judgment to make the final decision which undermines the purpose of collective decision-making on which the model reviewing is based on. Second, you need to give an acceptance score that indicates the extent to which you would like to see the paper being accepted. Deciding on this is a difficult matter, especially when reviewing for the first time, as it often involves comparing to the elusive notion of a magic threshold that the paper has to pass to be accepted at a given conference in terms of its originality and scientific quality. So how do you proceed in this case anyway? Beyond the correctness of mass and the validity of the obtained experimental results, which can call for reject without further consideration, I try to evaluate every paper with respect to two other criteria. First one is the extent to which the problem that the paper addresses is challenging and whether it really requires proposing or applying previously unexplored solutions. A good way to understand this is to roughly answer the following question. Does this paper advance my own understanding of some phenomena and brings a new point of view that I find interesting? This question filters out incremental contributions. If it adds very little to your own understanding of how a given problem can be solved or how something works, then most likely the main idea of this is indeed incremental. Second criterion is whether the proposed solution has the potential of leading to novel contribution in its own or related areas. Once again, estimating this can be roughly done by answering the following question. Does this paper spur any novel ideas? Do I see any forthcoming contributions that can be derived from it? If the answer is yes, then the paper you are reviewing is definitely worth considering for acceptance. My takeaway message for this part is the following. Given a technically sound paper with no major flaws, I suggest leaning towards acceptance if your answer to one of the last two questions is yes. If the paper has major flaws, then it should be rejected in most of the cases as conferences do not allow changes in the manuscript after the submission and during the rebuttal phase, with one notable exception being the ICLR conference. Well, that seems to be pretty much it. Thank you a lot for watching this video. For more details, I would like to encourage you to also check my Medium article where I give a full, detailed example of how to write a review for an ICLR conference paper. You can find the link below. Take care and best of luck for all of you. Cheers.